They tell us they're going to stop funding for breast cancer screenings and STD testing. They tell us that regardless of whether the Iran Treaty is working or not, they're going to kill it on day one if they're elected. They tell us they're going to round up 12 million people and deport them. Now, what does that sound like to you? They tell us they're going to double the size of our military, but do away with health care for 15 million people who just got it. They're telling us that it's OK to disobey the laws of the United States and the Supreme Court if you just happen to not agree with them. They want to encourage bigotry and inaccurate lies about our president. I guess you all heard that thing in New Hampshire. <laughs> they tell us they're going to appoint people to the Supreme Court that will throw us back 50 years. And by the way, it was 58 years ago this very day that an injunction was gotten by Thurgood Marshall to stop troops being used at Central High School. And what are they for? Where is the positive vision to inspire Americans to come together? Their words are deliberate in their intention to divide us and spread fear and bigotry amongst us. And it's true here in Arkansas. Currently using this hatred of our president and disdain for health care for women, equal rights for the LGBT community, and wanting to shut down the private option. Just the other day, the Hutchinson administration said that it was OK for insurance companies to have 30 days to file their extensions, but the people who they are insuring can only have 10 days. We can't afford to set aside the rhetoric because they are proving that when they get into office, they're going to do exactly what they say. History teaches us that walls are never built to keep people out. Most of the time, they are end up being built to keep people in. The moment we stop caring for each other is the moment we lose our humanity. Arkansas Democrats have never stopped caring for people. We've never stopped caring for those who've come here with different cultures. Just ask Walmart and Tyson's. <laughs> Democrats in Arkansas have never stopped caring about women's rights, no matter what the cost has been. <laughs> Democrats fought to stop Governor Hutchinson from kicking 50,000 people off of the private option. Because Democrats in Arkansas believe everybody deserves to have access to affordable health care. Are you, are you in fact really free if you can't go to the hospital or your doctor if you're sick? Arkansas Democrats have never stopped fighting for hard work in Arkansas families. Last year, who was it that got the minimum wage increase passed in Arkansas? So let me tell you, we have to stand together. But that's not enough. We're going to have to walk further, work harder. We got to volunteer. We're going to have to knock on doors, and we're going to do everything we can. And I promise you, this is going to pass. We will win back seats in the state legislature. You know, this is not the first time I got to talk before Secretary Clinton has come up here. 
and I sure as heck hope it's not going to be the last. I cannot think of anybody more qualified to be President of the United States. She'll be out here after a couple more speakers, and I hope you give these speakers the same, the same rowdy applause you've given me. Just remember why we're here. We're not here just to welcome her home. We're here to get her elected president. Thank you. see you. How are you all doing? I can't hear you. How are you doing? So they sent me out here with the task to make certain you all were fired up and ready. Are you fired up and ready? That's great. Ladies and gentlemen, it is an extreme, extreme honor and privilege to serve as a member of the House of Representatives as your minority leader. And today, I come to bring brief remarks about a remarkable woman and a great family that has meant so much to our great state, our country, and continue to be a beacon of hope for young people like myself and countless others that are in this audience today. So young people, are you out there? Are you ready? Today, this campaign, as you all have heard over months past, has become really personal. And you know what, that's right. For a lot of reasons, this campaign is personal to me. And that's exactly what my message is about this afternoon, making it personal for each and every Arkansan in this room. So many of you, whether you travel across this great country, go into a supermarket, or talk to people over the phones and highways and byways, are probably often asked, oh, you're from Arkansas, do you know the Clintons? <laughs> Everyone asks, do we know the Clintons? So in some way, shape, form, or fashion, they have made this personal for us. And despite the countless attacks, that she, our Madam Secretary, our First Lady, the woman that I think is most qualified for this job, has faced over the last months, she has remained remarkably strong in her position in this campaign to fight. As our wonderful chairman just mentioned, this is a fight, and this campaign continues to grow stronger by the day. Some of you in this audience, may listen to polls and may not believe that this is so, but here are the facts. This campaign has over 60,000 volunteers across this country. 60,000 people, ladies and gentlemen. They continue to aim at reaching people exactly where they are on a day in and day out basis. And this is why she is here on the campus of Philander Smith today. Because of her steadfastness, her toughness, and her continued efforts to prove that she can and will stand in the trenches and fight for us. This is why she came today. You know, on another note of making this personal, I can recall at the tender age of 10, being sent on an assignment outside of my church on Locust Street in North Little Rock to greet this lady coming to my church to speak on behalf of her husband who was running for governor. And that was Hillary Clinton. And I remember greeting her at her car door introducing myself and walking her into my church. And at that time, I looked up and said, wow, this is amazing. She's here to speak for her husband. And in that message, when I was just 10 years old, she talked about safer communities in a community of Arkansas where our communities were crime riddled at the time. She talked about making our economy stronger and making certain we had more jobs for those that were displaced. And I never forgot that. She went on to carry that fight as the First Lady and fought when necessary beside her great husband, President Clinton. And from there, she went on to make her own platform, fighting for single mothers, fighting for the children of our great state, and fighting for the future. As the senator of her great state of New York, she kept the fight up. As the Secretary of the State, she fought for our country. And now, as the next President of the United States of America, she will fight for us then too.
You see, ladies and gentlemen, you really do have to make this personal. And as I prepared my remarks today, I couldn't look any further than my wonderful wife. You see, she and I are expecting our first child next March. And I'm expecting to tell my child, like I tell so many other children, that I was able to stand toe to toe with one of the greatest leaders in our country and watch us elect our first African-American president and now elect our first woman president. And that is what this is all about. This fight is about the future of my child. This fight is about making equality better, making our education system stronger and our economy viable. Will you all stand with Hillary Clinton and fight? Let's go do it. Thank you guys very much. God bless you and God bless America. The student body president of Philander Smith College, Tanisha Manning. Philander Smith College. Woo! It is my pleasure to stand before you today as the Student Government Association President for the 2015-2016 academic year. And we welcome you to our campus. We are a United Methodist institution where we graduate students grounded as social justice advocates determined to change the world for the better. And, yes, yes, and in the midst of it being HBCU week, I have to state, we are the greatest historically black college. We are the greatest, yes. So who's ready to see Hillary Clinton? Not quite, I have a few questions, not quite. Who's registered to vote? I need to know, who's registered to vote? Okay, okay, okay. Now, who's not registered? It's okay if you're not, I just need to know, I need to know. You are in luck. Tomorrow is National Voter Registration Day. And here on this campus, from 12 to 4 o'clock p.m., you can come get registered to vote. So, if you are not registered, you have an opportunity, no problem. Now, who all supports Hillary Clinton? <laughs> yes. We love to see the support. I want to charge each of you, if you really support her, get out to the streets and volunteer. This event would not have been successful if it had not been for all of our student and community volunteers. We need you to get out. Knock on the doors. You know, pass out any flyers, stickers, pass them out, encourage them because she is our future president of the United States of America. Yes, it's so interesting. We sent out a survey to the student body about a week and a half ago, and we have a Bless the Mic lecture series. And so this year we decided to ask the students who would they like to see? And we gave a list of names and the top political advocate was Hillary Clinton. <laughs> students, we made it happen. The students requested her and now look, just days later, she is in our presence. Isn't that exciting? Yes. You all look so great today and we are so happy to see you here. I want to acknowledge the college students because we do matter. Yes, all the college students. Let's be honest, it's really about us, right? Right. It's really about us. And Hillary Clinton understands that. She understands that the cost barriers, that those are a problem. How many of us have to take out loans to attend this prestigious institution and any other institution? She understands those problems. And then when we take out those loans six months later, we have to pay it back. 
So she understands that, and she has plans put in place, well, that she will have put in place if she is elected. But I have to charge you all to commit to vote for her. You all have to go out and get just as many that's in here today to pack the place out, whether it's in your hometown, I know everyone's not from here, or just travel around the, the nation. So we can say the world, that's fine. <laughs> that's fine. But now I'll be quiet, and I want to introduce two important people to the stage. Our 14th president of Philander Smith College, Dr. Roderick L. Smothers, and not only that, but former First Lady of Arkansas, former First Lady of the United States, former Secretary of State, former U.S. Senator, the one and only Hillary Clinton. <laughs> Madam Secretary, I want to walk out with you more often. I love this. Ladies and gentlemen, good evening. I am Roderick L. Smothers, Sr., and I have the honor and privilege of serving as president of this fine institution, Philander Smith College. And on behalf of our faculty, our staff, our students, our alumni, and our board of trustees, many of whom are here today, I welcome you to Philander Smith College. Your visit here today brings you to one of the most progressive institutions of higher education in Arkansas. A proud, historically black college with a rich heritage, a powerful mission, and most importantly, a bright future. Our mission is to graduate academically accomplished students who are grounded as advocates for social justice and determined to make the world a better place. Our students, many of whom you've met, exemplify what it means to move Philander forward, and they are truly Philander men and Philander women. And because of their presence here today, they are learning how to make this world a better place, Madam Secretary. At Philander, we're teaching our students to not only have an understanding for world concerns, but to figure out solutions to those concerns. And as president, I am honored today for the opportunity to introduce someone who really personifies the mission statement of Philander Smith College. She too has dedicated her life to improving the lives of others. She's been a tough, pragmatic leader in Arkansas and around the globe. And like our students, she continues to be an outspoken advocate for social justice and women's rights. During her time as First Lady of Arkansas, she helped to establish our Hippie program, which provided a 30-week school-ready parental involvement program for parents with children from three to five. She also co-founded the Arkansas Advocates for Children and Families, a state-level alliance with the Children's Defense Fund. Her track record is one that shows that she will continue to fight for American families and American communities. Hillary Clinton believes that we need to build a better economy for tomorrow, strengthen American families, defend our core values, and renew the promise of democracy. And despite all of these things, she has achieved many firsts in her role as First Lady of the United States, U.S. Senator, and Secretary of State. And now, and now, 
She is campaigning to be the first woman president of the United States. Madam Secretary, we are happy to have you back home in Arkansas. And ladies and gentlemen, Philander Community, Arkansas, welcome to the podium. The next president of the United States, Hillary Rodham Clinton. Thank you so much. Whoa. I, I, I have to tell you, I... I am thrilled, thrilled to be here at Philander Smith. Thank you so much, Dr. Smothers. Thanks to everyone at this wonderful college. I remember so well working with and supporting Philander Smith as a United Methodist. I take it very personally that Philander Smith is training and educating the next generation of American leaders. I want to thank Tanisha Manning, who introduced us to the stage. Tanisha is the president of the Philander Smith College. And Tanisha, when I get done breaking that glass ceiling, you should come after me. I am so excited to be back here. You know, this is a place that holds so many wonderful memories for me and for my family. Uh, I was listening to Dr. Smothers talk about some of the work we did together. I was thinking back uh, about helping the Arkansas Children's Hospital begin to grow and become one of the best in the world. Thinking about the work we did to reform education so that Arkansas students could be competitive with students anywhere thinking about the fact my daughter was born here at Little Rock, and I, I know she was just here uh, promoting a wonderful book she's written about how young people can be more involved in bringing about positive change. Just memories flood, flood, flood through my head. I owe so much to the people of this state, and I'm so grateful for the years I had to live here the friendships that I made, the lessons that I learned. And I can tell you this, when I'm president, Arkansas will be on my mind every chance I can. Think about, think about what we can do together. You know, being here at this historic black college, I am reminded about how important it is that we stay focused on what's going to give our children and our young people, like the young men and women here at Philander Smith, the chances they should have to live up to their own God-given potential. That is, to me, the biggest challenge and obligation that any of us face, whether in our private lives, our families, our communities, or indeed our country. I wanted to come here today to tell you that we need, to, we need to win this next election so that we can make sure that every child has the same chance to go as far as his or her dreams and hard work will take her. I'm, I'm asking for your help. I want everybody who's ready to organize and volunteer to help us win this election to get involved. We are not going to let our country be taken backwards by people who are out of touch and out of date. Now, it won't surprise you to hear me say that I think the country does better when we have a Democrat in the White House. I think you can go back in history and see that, but let's just go back 35 years. We've had five presidents, three Republicans and two Democrats. I am privileged to have known both of those Democrats. I gotta tell you, 
It gives me great joy to go around bragging about Bill Clinton and Barack Obama every chance I get. Because each one of them inherited messes from their Republican predecessors. When my husband came into office, he had a lot of work that needed doing. In fact, he saw the national debt quadruple and the deficit increase and the economy slow down, so he got to work. And at the end of those eight years, we had 23 million new jobs in America. And most importantly, for the first time in decades, everybody benefited, not just those at the top. Everybody's incomes went up in the middle. At the bottom, people felt like they had a real opportunity and they were working hard for it. And he ended up with a balanced budget and a surplus. So, so he really produced the kind of results in the economy that I want to see us do again. And, and then when President Obama was elected, look at the mess we were in. I mean, the Republicans want us to have collective amnesia and forget. Our country was losing 800,000 jobs a month. Now, right after the election back in 08, President-elect Obama called me and asked me to come see him in Chicago, and I didn't know why, but I was happy to do it. Turns out he wanted me to be Secretary of State, but before we got to that conversation, he said something that sounded very much like what my husband had said shortly after he'd been elected. Like, things were a lot worse. Things were a lot worse than people knew. Yes, we were in a great recession, but it could have been a great depression. People forget millions were losing jobs. Homes were being foreclosed on. Businesses were closing. So the president-elect said to me, he said, you know, we got problems around the world, but I got to focus on the problems right here at home. We got to get to work. And he got to work. And look what happened. Saved the auto industry. Right? Began to crack down on Wall Street abuses and got 16 million more people health insurance. I, you know, I, I don't think President Obama gets the credit he deserves for helping to save the economy and dig us out of the ditch we were in. But my point is this. Things work better with a Democrat in the White House. The numbers are clear. Economic growth is stronger. Unemployment is lower. The stock market rises faster. Businesses do better. Deficits are smaller. Under Republican presidents, by contrast, we are four times as likely to have a recession. So when you look at the facts, you got to ask yourself, are we going back? to the same failed economic policies that got us in those troubling positions before. Now, I, I'm, not, I'm not running for my husband's third term. I'm not running for President Obama's third term. I'm running for my first term, but I'm gonna do what works. going to remind people of all these inconvenient facts <laughs> about what works better and how we have to cement the progress that enables us to tell every single American, if you work hard and you do your part, you can get ahead and stay ahead. That is exactly what we have to deliver on. And we're out of that big ditch, thank goodness, but we're not doing what we need to do. We're not running yet. Jobs have come back, more than 13 million of them, but wages aren't rising. The cost of everything else is going up, from college to prescription drugs, right? So the centerpiece of my campaign will be to raise incomes. That will be my mission. When Americans get a fair shot at the income they deserve, 
then we will be moving back to where we should be in America. I have, I have no doubt this is not going to be an easy election because the other side have simple, wrong, but simple answers. <laughs> I think we need growth that is strong, fair, and long-term. I think we have to make sure that the rewards of success don't go just to those at the top who have been well taken care of. Just look at some of these comparisons. The 25 richest hedge fund managers earn more each year than all the kindergarten teachers in America combined. Multi-millionaires pay lower tax rates than nurses and teachers. We gotta close those loopholes. We have to make it clear that our tax code must be reformed so that people at the top pay their fair share to fund this great company of ours. And I want to applaud the voters of Arkansas because you raised the minimum wage by popular vote in the last election. I want us to raise it at the federal level so that people who work hard, work full time, don't still live in poverty. And, and you know, two thirds of the people making the minimum wage are women. Women with children women with responsibilities, women who are doing the best they can to keep body and soul together. So we've got to take on all of the challenges that stand in the way of people living up to and fulfilling their own dreams. I'm going to focus, of course, on all the big issues that are in the headlines, you know, preventing Iran from getting a nuclear weapon, dealing with the refugee crisis and terrorist networks. I know how to do that in a way that will put America's values first, that will make us once again able to put coalitions together like I did for the Iran sanctions, that will give us the tools we need using diplomacy. But I also know that the problems that keep people up at night, you know, those quiet problems that you worry about at the kitchen table are important too. You know, just on Saturday I was in New Hampshire and I was meeting some of the teachers who support me. I'm so honored that the National Education Association of New Hampshire has endorsed me. You see, I have this old-fashioned idea that if we're going to make education better, we ought to listen to the teachers who are actually in the classrooms, working with the kids, trying to figure out how to make them successful. And, and I was talking to one of the teachers, and he was telling me that He's now responsible for taking care of his mother with Alzheimer's. And he can't find a caretaker for her, so he takes her to work with him. And then I've met grandmothers who are taking care of their grandchildren because the parents have gotten addicted to drugs. I've heard veterans who've told me they're not getting the care they need or their buddies aren't getting the care they need, right? Families who are desperately looking for help to get the mental health treatment that their family member needs. <laughs> Teachers trying to help students who come to school hungry, which makes it pretty hard to be able to concentrate and learn, doesn't it? These are, these are challenges, problems, situations in everybody's lives. And I think the president needs to care about those as well. You know, if you want a president who will tell you everything that's wrong with America and who's to blame, you've got plenty of other choices. <laughs> you heard enough of that in the Republican debate, didn't you? But if you want a president who will listen to you and work her heart out for you to make your life better and make our country stronger and fairer, you're looking at her, Arkansas. <laughs> you know, I've been 
I've been fighting my whole life to even the odds for people who have those odds stacked against them. And I'm going to keep doing that. I'm going to do it during this campaign. I will do it in the White House, fighting for families, fighting for fairness, fighting for all of you. And I, I think, you know, I think I, I got that from my mother, my mother Dorothy, uh, who I think about every day and miss every day, who lived with us till the end of her life, lived to the wonderful age of 92. But she had a miserable childhood. She was uh, mistreated, neglected, abandoned by her parents and her grandparents. Terrible feeling. You don't feel like you want it. By the age of 14, she was working as a housemaid in some other family's house, able to support herself. I didn't know any of this when I was a little girl. And as I got older and I learned about it, I was just really amazed. How do you get treated like that and not lose heart, not get broken and bitter? So I asked her, she said, you know, along the way people showed me kindness. Even though my parents and my grandparents didn't treat me like I mattered, other people did. You know, like that first grade teacher who saw she didn't have enough to eat and so brought extra food. And without embarrassing her, you know, I said, oh, Dorothy, I brought too much food today. Would you like some? And then as my mother looked back as an adult, she realized that the teacher fed her the entire year, sometimes the only meal she got during that day. Or when she went to work in the other family's home, the mother of the house realized that my mother really wanted to go to high school. She'd only gotten through the eighth grade before she had to leave her grandparents' home and go to work. So that woman said to her, you know, if you get your work done early in the morning, you can go to high school. Now, some people might think that's kind of harsh, 14-year-old, you know, having to work. Well, for my mother, it was a gift. She'd get up really early. She'd get those chores done. She'd run to high school. She'd run back. And she got to continue her education. I tell you this because when I think about what we need to do in our country, I don't think only about the programs and the policies and the political campaigns. I think about how we have to treat each other again. How we have to show kindness and respect and love. And how we have to put ourselves in other people's shoes and think about what their lives are like. I remember very well over the years meeting a lot of people who didn't have health insurance. People whose only doctor was whoever they got when they went to the emergency room. Who were so worried that their medical bills would literally bankrupt them. And I thought, we have to do something about this. You know, back when, when Bill became president, he said to me, we gotta, we gotta figure out how to help people. And as First Lady, you might remember, I fought hard for affordable health care for every American. And when the insurance companies and others blocked our way, I was, of course, disappointed. But I tried to remember my mother. And I didn't get discouraged. I said, OK, what are we going to do now? And I went back to work with leaders on both sides of the aisle to help create the children's health insurance program that provides health insurance to eight million kids in America. And nearly two decades later, I was so proud to be a member of President Obama's administration when he signed the Affordable Care Act. And you know what? It's working. The rate of uninsured Americans has fallen below 10% for the first time in 50 years. And the rate of uninsured African Americans has been cut nearly in half. And 
overall costs are growing at the slowest rate in decades. Yet all the Republican candidates for president are determined to get rid of the Affordable Care Act. Republicans in Congress have tried to repeal it 54 times. 54 times! Well, I am not going to let them rip away the progress we've made that has meant so much to so many. I'm not going to let them rip this law up and kick 16 million people off their health coverage and force this country to start the health care debate all over again. That's not going to happen on my watch. Why? Why would you repeal something that's working? And it's not just people who have insurance for the first time, it's people with insurance who have a better deal. What are you going to tell the three million young people who are now getting insurance because they can stay on their parents' plans until they turn 26? Why would you tell 129 million people with pre-existing conditions that they are in danger of losing their coverage? And why would you subject 158 million women and girls to the risk and indignity of being charged more again for health insurance than men are? Why would we do that? I, I want to build on the progress we made, and I want to make it better. There are problems. You know, let's be clear about that. I want to do more to bring down costs for families and ease burdens on small businesses, make sure that consumers have the choices you deserve. And it is time to deal with skyrocketing out-of-pocket costs and runaway prescription drug prices that are going up last year by 12 percent. I, I mean, it's disgraceful. Go online, read this article in the New York Times today about a pill that is really important, and the company decided rather than uh, continue to charge a small amount, they would up it to $750, a pill, for no good reason. Medications for a lot of diseases are going up to thousands of dollars a month. And when you look at that article that I referenced, to go in one day from $13.50 to $750 because the company said it needed more profits. I, I am announcing a detailed plan to crack down on these abuses. There's no excuse. Look, we, we want companies to get a fair return. That's the way our system works. There's no excuse from going from $13.50 to $750 for one pill. We're going to start by capping how much you have to pay out of pocket for prescription drugs each month. And we're going to start holding the drug companies accountable to drive down the prices. Nobody in America should have to choose between buying the medicine they need and paying their rent. And we also have to make sure that rural communities don't get left behind. You know, years ago, I led a commission on rural health here in Arkansas that worked on increasing access in remote parts of our state. And, and still today, it's difficult in some areas. There aren't enough facilities. There aren't enough physicians, uh, nurse practitioners, and others. Telemedicine can help, but we need to streamline licensing and explore how to make that reimbursable under Medicare. We've got to make sure that everybody gets a chance to have the same kind of health access that I do, or you do, or anyone else in our country does. And, and look, I'm, I'm going to brag on Arkansas again. I'm going to brag on Arkansas again because I was just in Louisiana. I love Louisiana. It's a wonderful state. But when you compare the way the politicians in Louisiana responded to increasing access to Medicaid, and if you compare it to what the politicians here in Arkansas did, it is no comparison at all. This state, in a bipartisan agreement, decided to expand access 
to Medicaid. And <laughs> 250,000 people in Arkansas got access to coverage. That's one of the reasons why the uninsured rate here in Arkansas was cut nearly in half. And it makes perfect sense. Fewer people with insurance, without insurance, leads to fewer visits to emergency rooms, leads to more prevention, leads to lower costs, and healthier people. Look at this. Arkansas has already saved more than $30 million last year alone, and the state will save hundreds of millions of dollars in the years to come. So we have a real life experiment. Compare what Republicans and Democrats agreed to do in Arkansas with what they did not do under their governor in Louisiana. Republicans in Louisiana refused to accept federal dollars to expand Medicaid. So the result is more than 190,000 people, most of them hardworking families trying to get ahead, were left with no health insurance. They saw none of the benefits that Arkansas has seen. And it disproportionately fell on people of color and poor people, of course. So when I talk about what we should be doing, we should be looking for people to come together like what happened here in Arkansas that can help more people get ahead. So there's a lot to be done, and I'm excited about this campaign. One area I'm particularly excited about is college affordability and paying down student debt. I want you to take a look at my new college compact on my website, hillaryclinton.com, and here's what it says, that you should not be prevented from held back from, have to drop out from, and not graduate from <laughs> the costs of higher education. In fact, I don't think anybody should have to borrow money to pay tuition for public colleges and universities. I think it's important that we put more federal dollars into helping the historically black colleges and universities like Philander Smith. And when you already have student debt, we should refinance that debt. You can refinance your car or your house. I want you to be able to refinance your debt as well. And then I think we also we also have to admit that we've got some work to do when it comes to race and justice. We should all say loudly and clearly, Black Lives Matter. And then we have to take on continuing discrimination in health care, in housing, in education, criminal justice, the correction system. But this is the work of this generation, to unleash your energy and your commitment. And I want to be one of the people who convinces you, calls you to do just that. You know, as a United Methodist, I really do think works matter. We. We believe in grace and being saved by it, don't we? But we also believe we are called upon to demonstrate that grace. You know, one of my favorite quotes on this comes from St. Francis of Assisi, who said, preach the gospel and if necessary, use words. I think there is a, there's a secular comparison here because in our country, we need to quit talking past each other. We need to quit hurling insults and attacks against each other. 
We need to stop listening to the mean-spiritedness and hateful rhetoric that comes out of people in the public arena. And we need to start finding our way forward to actually deal with the problems we've got again. You know, if you watch that Republican debate, 15, hour, 15 candidates, five hours, not a single fighter for the middle class, not one offered a credible plan to make college more affordable or to have a preschool program that can give our kids a better start in life. And they have nothing to say about the continuing outrage of women getting paid less than men for doing the same job. It is way past time to get us to equal pay for equal work. I had, I had a little girl at an event say she had a question for me and I bent down so I could hear her because she was so soft spoken. She was like seven or eight. She said, if you're a girl president, will you get paid the same as a boy president? <laughs> I said, well, that's one of the jobs you have to because that's in the law. I have a lot of other parents bringing their daughters. They bring me these placemats with all the president's faces on them. And they say, my daughter looked at this placemat. She said, where are the girls? I said, well, that's what we're trying to change. We're going to try to add one of those pictures to the placemat. So friends, you know, I know that a lot of young people have so much on your minds. You've got school or work, you've got obligations you're taking on, you're trying to figure out what the future looks like for you, but I want you to also recognize that politics is important. Who we choose to be our leaders, whether you exercise the vote that people literally died for, makes a big difference. I am so grateful for all of the opportunities that I've had, but I don't think that's enough. I want all of you and everyone like you to have whatever opportunities you seek be within reach. You know, I'm the granddaughter of a factory worker. My grandfather went to work in the Scranton Lace Mills in Scranton, Pennsylvania every day of his working life. He worked really hard, but he did it because he had to support his family, but he also did it because he believed that it would pay off for the next generation, and it did. His three sons all went to college, something that was really unheard of. And my dad started a small business, a really small business, printing drapery fabric. And then I'm standing here asking you to vote for me for president. And so I don't, I don't want us ever to lose that forward progress that has been the hallmark. We have overcome a lot. We had to fight a civil war. We had to change the Constitution to let women vote. We had to have a civil rights movement that cost lives. We have gone through so much in our country, and I feel like that effort of prior generations would be dishonored if we all don't do our part. You know, many years ago, my youth minister at my church in the town I grew up in outside of Chicago asked our youth group if we wanted to go hear Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. speak. Well, of course, I said yes, and my mother signed that permission slip right away. So one cold day, we went to downtown Chicago, a place called Orchestra Hall, where we got to hear Dr. King preach. It was a transformational experience. Of course, I'd heard about him, but to see him in person talking about what we needed to do, what we were called to do, 
just pierced my heart and my mind. I stood in line, along with everybody else, just to shake his hand. I've thought about that night a lot. I was in college when he was assassinated, and I was just, I was so angry. I was so mad, I was so upset that someone who was talking about the dreams we could have together, the opportunities for America to be what we should be had been cut down. We have different problems today, but a lot of the same feelings are the same. I met with a small group of the Black Lives Matter activists, and I just felt for them because they too were so upset by what we have seen in our criminal justice system and the unfairness and the discrimination. But then I asked them, so what will you do to help change things? How will you organize? How will you support those who you think are more likely to make those changes? Because at the end of the day, we are a democracy, and those who show up and vote get to call the shots. Voting rights are under attack in many places in the country. I want us to have automatic registration for every 18-year-old in America. And then I want young people to turn out and vote. Vote for your futures. Vote for what you want to see this country become. You know, I am a new grandmother, in case you haven't heard. And my wonderful little granddaughter turns one next Saturday. Yeah, it's pretty amazing. And Bill and I have just been overwhelmed. It's just the most extraordinary experience, spending time with this new little person in your family. And of course, you know, we're going to do everything we can to make sure she has every opportunity that she can possibly take advantage of. But that's not enough, folks. What kind of country is she going to grow up in? What kind of world is going to be waiting for her? It's not enough that the granddaughter of a former president gets opportunity in America. I want the granddaughters of factory workers and the grandsons of truck drivers and every single child in this country to have the same opportunity. So I'm asking you to join me. Join me in this campaign about our future. Join me in making sure every child does get a chance to live up to his or her God-given potential. Let's go out and make the future that we deserve to have for all of you. Thank you, and God bless you.